argument from ignorance. I'm talking about the argument from ignorance. Okay? It's one thing that gets thrown at Christians all the time. You're arguing from ignorance. God did it. That's an argument from ignorance. I can't figure this out. God did it. But they do not recognize that their own squad, they argue from ignorance all the time. One of the great heroes of the atheist creed, uh, his name is Richard Dawkins. I saw him just the other day. He's on a YouTube video I was watching. He starts arguing from ignorance. Yeah. He starts going, you know, the God of the Old Testament is not a God. Oh, God, my Richard Dawkins. I got to give it up. Got to give it up. Okay. The God of the Old Testament is not a God that I would want to worship. He's a mean, vindictive God. He's cruel. He does this, that, and the other thing. It's a complete argument from ignorance. Now, this is slightly amazing to me because Richard Dawkins does this for a living. He talks about the Bible and talks about, you know, Christian issues and atheist issues and religious issues for a living. So you would think he would have at least a, a, a working grasp of the theology behind the Bible. Now, the Old Testament theology and the theology of Christianity, it makes no bones about the fact that there is a side of God's character that is, shall we say, you know, terrible. In the New Testament, they warn you, they say, consider therefore the kindness and the severity of God. The Bible makes no bones about the dual nature of God's character. That there is a loving, kind side to God's character, a generous side to God's character, and a terrible side. And it says, terrible. Those are the words of the Bible itself. Terrible. Judgment Day is called the terrible day of the Lord. Terrible day. A great and terrible God. There is a dual nature to his character. And you don't want to mess with the dark side of God. You don't want to mess with his bad side. He's hardcore. He's going to smite you. The type of God you don't want to meet in a dark alley after having done something wrong because he's going to deliver a smiting and you're going to be on the receiving end of that smiting. The Bible talks about that God all the time. And, and Richard Dawkins seems not to understand the underlying theological point. For the most part, it's in the Old Testament that we, we meet this, this Yahweh, this hardcore Yahweh. He's going to smite some people. He's going to cause a flood. He's going to zap you. For the most part, that's an Old Testament. We meet him in the Old Testament. The New Testament acknowledges that side of God's character, but for the most part, we meet him in the Old Testament. What is the underlying theological argument? The underlying theological argument is this. Holy man, I mean, holy God, rather, meets carnal man, and it doesn't go so well. The argument of the Old Testament is it doesn't go well, and, the, and, and it can't go well. Because carnal man meets holy God. And if it were to go well, the New Testament would be superfluous. It would, there would be no point. It doesn't go well because holy God and carnal man cannot interact. And, the, and the, 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 how, that, how that bad relationship goes down usually is holy God sm dealing out smitings and beatings and floods and famines to carnal man. Something else is required, this, hence the New Testament. There is required a mediator between God and man. Enter Jesus Christ, 100% God, so he can fully and completely satisfy holy God. He can walk perfectly as God, and yet 100% man. So he is 100% completely identifiable to us. We can relate 100% to him because he is one of us. He is both God and man. This is the main theological argument of the Old Testament. So when Richard Dawkins starts talking about, you know, I wouldn't want to meet the God of the Bible, that's a point of the Bible. Of course you wouldn't, without Jesus as your Savior. Because he's going to deliver, he's going to deliver a smiting. You're going to do something wrong in his presence and he's going to smite you. But... That is why he sent the Savior, the, inter the intermediary between God and man. That is Jesus Christ. Now, a little further down the road, um, we have the concept of, of 
Why does God need, why did God need Jesus to forgive us? Couldn't he just have forgiven us? Why do you need, why do you need to send Jesus? I've seen, I've seen this on memes, atheist memes. Why do you need to send Jesus? He could have just forgiven us. And that would be that. Somewhat of a logical concept. Again, an argument from ignorance. If you don't understand the theology of the Bible. Or the theolo theology behind it. You see, holy God meets carnal man. It does not go well. Because carnal man is incapable of walking correctly in front of holy God. He will constantly do things that will incite the ire and, and the aggravation and the wrath of holy God. Constantly, in his nature, by his nature. So he need, God needed to send somebody. Now, why did God need to, to send Jesus? Well, let me, let, here, let me give you an analogy this way. Pretend you have a child, an infant, okay? You love this infant and you adore this infant. But he's an infant. He's a little baby. Which means there are certain things that he is going to do by his nature. And there are certain things that he is not capable of. You're not going to, you're not going to leave him alone and say, hey, write a book, two-year-old. And he's not, going to, he's not going to do it, okay? Because it's not in his nature. He, he's not capable of doing that. And there are certain things that he is not capable of understanding because he's a little infant. Now, you have a beautiful room. You love this infant. Maybe it's a baby. I'm not sure exact age we would be talking about. You love this little kid with all your heart. You have a room. In this room are valuable paintings. And there are, you know, vases that are worth a lot of money. There are antiquities lying over the floor and there's a, there's a valuable carpet. You put the infant in the room and you go away for seven hours. Gee, I wonder what's going to happen. Yeah, you come back. You come back seven hours later and the room is completely, completely destroyed. The baby's torn the paintings off the wall, he's wrote his name and poop on the wall, and he's knocked over the lamps, he's knocked over all the antiquities, he's broken hundreds, hundreds of thousand dollars worth of stuff. Is he guilty? Is he, is he wrong? Is he bad? No. He's an infant. He acted in accordance with his nature. You freak out, but you still love the infant. Okay? Did he necessarily do anything wrong? No, of course not. The argument of the Bible is that we act according to our nature. Original sin. They don't understand the concept of original sin. It's not, we're evil beings. That's not what original sin is. It's that in our human nature, in our carnal nature, we are given over to corruption. Corruption is part and parcel of how we are. Period. Forever and always. Just like the little baby acts in accordance with his nature. He cannot help but act otherwise. You put a little baby in a room, he's going to break all this stuff and he's going to write his name and poop on the wall. That's what a little baby does. Period. Forever and always. Now, someone's still got to pay for all the furniture. You love the baby. You love the kid. Someone still has to pay for all the furniture. There is still an accounting that needs to be done. Regardless of whether the kid intended to break all this stuff or not. This stuff is still worth money. And there's still an accounting that needs to be done. Same idea. Why does Jesus have to go to the cross? Because God put us on this world to govern it. And we are incapable of it in our human nature. Without God's guidance, without God to help us. We are incapable of governing ourselves. First argument in the Bible. We are incapable of governing ourselves because we are ruled by our flesh. So we act out constantly in our flesh and then justify it after, after the fact. So hence, argument number one, we are incapable of governing ourselves without God because we always act in accordance with our nature and we justify it after the fact and we call that morality. That's a long, in-depth argument that I will make in another video. Just That's enough for now on that. Argument number two, Collectively, we cannot run the world properly because of our human nature. So we produce sin. We act sinful all the time, constantly. Does it mean we're evil? No. It's our human nature. Which is still destructive. We can't run the world properly.
That's why the world is so chaotic and disordered and crazy. Because that's what happens when man is without God. That's what the world looks like. Without God intervening. Thousand year reign of Christ, the world isn't going to look like that. That's the argument of the Bible. Whether you believe it or not is immaterial. That's the argument being made. Thousand year reign of Christ, the world is not going to look like that. It's going to be all beauty and, 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 and peace and no sickness and no death. Because God will be in charge then, not us, not our human nature. Someone still has to pay the price. All of this, all of this sorrow and anguish and sadness and sin was produced by us in our human nature. Did we mean to do it? Not necessarily. We could not help ourselves like the little infant. Does God still love us? A hundred percent. Someone's still got to pay the price. There's still broken stuff all over the world. And God's got to take out his righteous anger on somebody or something. He's got to deliver a smiting or he ain't going to be satisfied. Now, I'm paraphrasing it a lot, but I'm paraphrasing so you get the general idea. And if you think about it and listen, re-listen to the tape and listen to it slowly, it will actually make a lot of sense to you. I'm, t I'm telling you it this way on purpose so that you understand it, giving you a different way to think about it so that you start to understand it deeper than you did before. Somebody's got to pay the price. The world is in chaos because of, human, because of human agency. The world is in chaos. And God is sitting up on his throne getting revved up and ready to throw down. And he's going to have to take out his holy righteous anger on somebody. And he loves you, and he loves me, so he sends Jesus so that he can take it out on him, and he doesn't have to take it out on you. So he can pour out his righteous anger on Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the innocent Lamb of God, the one person who doesn't, hasn't earned it. God can smite him so he doesn't have to smite you. He has to act in the world, in the real world, in order to satisfy himself. See if you can understand that. Why did he have to do it? Because he has to act in the real world as, an, as, a, as agency in the real world in order to satisfy himself. Because the sins that we committed were actually committed in real time, in the real world. Even me, the great holy man, did a whole bunch of sinful stuff in real time, in the real world. And somebody's got to pay the price for that. So God sends Jesus so he can take it out on Jesus and he doesn't have to take it out on you. That's the theology. Yes, there is a terrible aspect of God's character. You do not want to meet God as, you know, the next time you do something wrong, think about that. You don't want to meet God. <laughs> you don't want to see God right then. Because he's going to deliver a beatdown. So, I don't know if Richard Dawkins even understands the theology. I don't even know if he wants to understand the theology. But that's the very definition of the argument from ignorance. He doesn't really want to know. He doesn't really want to understand it. He'd rather just, you know, stand on the outside and poo-poo it. It's foolish. Silly. But there you have it.